this uh, last concluding session is on takeaways in terms of way forward and I think as uh, we were discussing in the last session, uh, one of the best messages that we need to emphasize on connectivity at the human level and everything else which is needed to promote that connectivity uh, needs to be in place so that that is the uh, aspect which, which must flourish. Uh, we have about uh, eight panelists and uh, one hour, uh, which means uh, no more than uh, three, four, or at the most five minutes each. I will very humbly request each one of you to kindly stick to the time, otherwise we'll run out of it. We are already very late. We can see that by the thinning audience around. Uh, with these words, uh, just tell us what now we should do about this aspect of connectivity how to proceed to strengthen what we think are the positive dimensions of it. Uh, you are the first two. Are you ready? Let Sujeev start. You can't go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's been very interesting two days, and uh, a lot of things have come up. And uh, I love to look at low-hanging fruits, and you know, listening to a diverse set of things. I must really, uh, you know, commend the fact that uh, over the two days, it's been a very positive discourse. And I'm Nepal's CEO, chief eternal optimist. I always see, you know, the glass full, <laughs> half full. And I do see out of these two days a lot of things coming up. And maybe some of the low-hanging fruits in connectivity would be, well, you know, what can people to people do? Of course, the governments are doing. There's a lot of discussions that are happening. There is a, an urgency for need to change. As I was, you know, tweeting yesterday that uh, Obor is a reality. It is about being yesterday also, as Rajat Das said, that whether we want to be proactive or reactive to it, I think as, uh, as South Asians, we have to look at that. I think these at government levels will happen, but at our levels, the key things we can look at is, one is among the youth, I've always been wanting to work with youth. I always enjoy the energy of the youth and to see that what can we do? And so maybe a youth exchange program, a very simple thing that maybe few people from IDSA can come. i more than happy to host at Nepal Economic Forum a few of my folks can come here, we can do that within the South, I mean, maybe create this critical mass. It could start with three to five people, you know, I mean, less than $5,000 expenditure a year, and maybe, you know, send them to Afghanistan, some people from Afghanistan coming here. I think that is something that can immediately begin, a youth exchange program that looks at people-to-people -people connectivity, learns culture, learns, you know, food, learns the music, learns the art, learns you know, about theater. I think that is one big piece I can see. The other is that um, we need to, if there is so much of bad news, then how do we create some good news? There could be just a portal that can be started, and we can ask some companies in each of our countries to put up, you know, banner ads and let it sustain. There has to be a business model around. Uh, and uh, we can have a portal that has positive stories coming out. You know, the story of, uh, uh, you know, the, the theater, the story of uh, the port in Afghanistan. So many things that I learned over two days, I think there are people wanting to learn. It's not about looking at who becomes the chief minister, where, and, you know, that hogs about, you know, one day of your, uh, you know, fa uh, your interaction with, uh, uh, with media in a week. So rather than that, how do we find positive stories about cricket, about football, about sports, arts? So, so there could be a portal. So I think it could be a humble beginning. That, if that happens regularly, that can feed into the larger policy discourse, larger discourse on how diplomacy should work, larger discourse on how embassies should function. I think perhaps that could be a very good feedback mechanism to look at the next steps. I'll stop here, sir. Thank you, Sujil. Uh, Dr. Najafi? Thank you very much.
should we do now? I think the way forward. Uh, if you look into the policy issue, I think there is need, since yesterday the discussion I'm hearing, that there is need to harmonize and common policy for productivity <coughs> in the region. Maybe there is possible uh, policy, but there is differences on that policy. We need to harmonize in a common policy for connecting, uh, for connectivity in the region. Another issue from my point of view, uh, South Asians should work together to build consensus. There are three important issues on transnational issues, such as extremism, terrorism, poverty, and promoted economic integration. Because there should be a unanimous, a unique definition of, of extremism, terrorism, poverty, and this kind of thing. Then it can help us uh, uh, definitely. Third issue, I think, from my point of view, that because we are very close to the, mm, uh, we have Panay, but Pakistan, trade issue between India and Pakistan, naturally hurting enhancement of trade, not just between the India and Pakistan, but in the entire region. It should be solved. It should be solved. A more permanent solution would require. I am recommended that South Asia and Central Asian leader, leader, they should go their way and convince Pakistan to integrate its transportation links into those greater regions. This is from my If this is not solved, I think today we have discussed with few people and another issue between Afghanistan and India maybe is uh, we can increase air transport and we can sign sky, open sky policy and we can work on the cargo uh, between the two countries. Another mechanism should be worked on. Uh, from a regional uh, perspective, the priority should be given to the development and upgrading of landlocked countries to change this landlocked countries, like my friend said, to land links countries. To do this, there are some technical issues to be solved, like there was a complaint, there is absence of single window system for color clearance of wood, woods and a lack of vehicle scanner. These are the technical issues should be solved. Border facilitation should be improved. These are the issues can be solved. Finally, as Allah Maikbal said, Afghanistan is heart of Asia. Regional state must realize that many South Asian countries and Central Asian countries share many common threats and opportunities. If, the poli if a political earth earthquake shakes Kabul, it will be filled in Islamabad and Delhi. It will be filled in Islamabad and Delhi too. Our prosperity is linked to each other's stability. Peace in Kabul means peace in Islamabad and Delhi as well. Another issue that the pe everyone uh, emphasized on that people-to-people -people activity. It's very important how people-to-people to people connect. On this issue, I think streamline of the visa and uh, easy procedure of visa and this kind of issue can, can help that. And also there is the current agreement, there is some initiative, SARC, uh, and also treaty signed between the Asian countries. But some of them is not fully implemented. My understanding is that, and my recommendation is that, the, s the South Asian countries should work to find a mechanism how to monitor the implementation of these treaties. And uh, I think uh, we should find a mechanism that how can be uh, fully implemented. Thank you. Thank you. the governments should step in uh, to play their role 
um, and we should not be dependent, uh, as uh, uh, Madhukarji said, uh, SAFMA closed down because foreign funding closed down. So there are many good initiatives uh, which uh, uh, do have to then depend out of necessity on foreign funding. Um, I think it should be something which we should be proud to own ourselves. And in that way, of course, uh, the government and corporate sectors in all our countries uh, should be encouraging uh, cultural uh, activity and uh, cultural exchange. Of course, the biggest issue still remains uh, the visa problem. Uh, like uh, businessmen between India and Pakistan, or there's a SARC visa for all the SARC countries. So I would propose that there should be a SARC visa for artists as well. Um, because uh, uh, these are people who obviously uh, bring goodwill and uh, in facilitating uh, the easy coming and going of artists, uh, not just between India and Pakistan, between all our countries. I think Nepal is the only place where we can probably go without, uh, Pakistanis can go without, uh, I mean, we can get a visa on arrival. Um, but uh, uh, I think Bangladesh, it's very difficult to get visas for Bangladesh, for instance, these days, <coughs> or for Pakistanis. Um, and we have had a, a great de deal of cultural contact with Bangladesh uh, after ba the creation of Bangladesh, um, uh, because we feel that it, it's an obviously part of the region, part of our history, part of our cultural traditions, and uh, something which has to be sustained and maintained. But again, the whole thing of e uh, visas uh, come in. Another thing where the, go uh, the government, particularly the government of India, could be very proactive, because India uh, culturally and uh, you know, institution-wise also has built up certain institutions like the National School of Drama, the Pune Film Institute, uh, etc. So uh, uh, most of our countries lack these training facilities for, for actors, for filmmakers. Um, and uh, like they're open, I mean, there are many Bangladeshi, Nepali students uh, uh, studying uh, here in these institutes in India. Uh, but of course, no Pakistani student, and uh, I feel that the, it would be great if India opens up opportunities for um, uh, you know actors and filmmakers to come in and uh, study in in India, um, uh, because uh, that you do India does have an advantage in the whole region uh, uh, because of its uh, very long history ever since independence of uh, uh, strengthening uh, these uh, performing arts uh, institutions. Um, and uh, then, of course, the the corporate sector, like we just uh, mentioned, uh, the Zindagi Channel showing uh, uh, Pakistani television dramas, which were really, really popular across the whole of India, not just North India. I mean, I've been to Bombay, and uh, people were avidly watching uh, Pakistani TV dramas, which stopped. And I think uh, Pakistan has been sensible enough to unban the films. I mean, the government never. I think both the governments never did this. This was again. The, you know, these were initiatives which were taken at the spur of the moment, were spontaneous initiatives, tit for tat uh, reactions, you might call it. And uh, uh, so after this fiasco, when Fawad Khan was sent back, much to the dis disappointment of millions of uh, Indian middle aged ladies <laughs> and young girls as well, because he had really become a heartthrob, um, uh, you know, Pakistan. Uh, the, uh, the film distributors themselves sort of put a ban on Indian films, not the Pakistan government. But then in January, two months, three months later, uh, they realized that our whole industry, uh, you know, the whole film uh, sort of cinemas were uh, closing down because uh, they were being run uh, because people love watching uh, Bollywood. And so the because of that eco economic necessity, I think it over uh, uh, sort of uh, ruled, uh, uh, overlooked the nationalistic and patriotic sentiments, and sheer practicality of economics uh, compelled our uh, uh, cinema owners and uh, dis distributors to restart Indian films. And of course, there are absurd situations in which uh, race uh, was banned uh, for being not anti-Pakistan, anti-Muslim, uh, although Shah Rukh Khan is a Muslim himself. But I think that happens in India, and I think a lot of it is happening in India as well. And as uh, you know, with the recent sort of sets being set on fire and what not, what not, uh, this sort of intolerance which is creeping in. And uh, I just end by saying that our poet Fahmida Riaz, who came and lived in India in exile during uh, Ziaz's time, he wrote a very famous nazam that you are absolutely like us. So I hope that this positive meaning, he didn't say positively. 
انہوں نے تو یہی یہاں یہاں پہ جو گروئنگ فنڈمنٹلزم اور ایکسٹریمزم یہاں بھی پائے جا رہی ہے ان کے بارے میں انہوں نے کہا تھا لیکن آئی ہوپ کہ یہ ایک پوزیٹیو طریقے اب وی ڈو سوری فار سلیپنگ ان ٹو اردو یو ڈو ازیوم دیٹ یو نو پیپل انڈرسٹینڈ بٹ آف کورس دا پیپل فرام آل اوور دا ریجن سو میننگ دیٹ یو اڈریسنگ انڈینس شی سیڈ دیٹ یو ہیو ٹرنڈ آؤٹ ٹو بی جسٹ لائک آس آئی مین دیر از نو ڈفرینس بٹوین پاکستانی انڈینس whether it's in the negative way or in a positive way. I hope we can take it in a positive way. And I think our governments have a great responsibility to, uh, to, to facilitate uh, this uh, uh, interaction between artists because we are people who appeal directly to the hearts and souls and the minds of, of uh, millions of people in the region. And I think this uh, should not, this uh, connection, this connectivity uh, should not be hampered in any way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Muthu Krishna. Yeah. Or you can come there if you wish to. Okay, no, it's all right. I, uh, okay, I'll, my point is, uh, Himar South Asian, I think, uh, asked me to write um, something about uh, on the occasion of 25th anniversary of SARC. So I'm going to uh, talk from that, uh, what I wrote uh, at that time. For me, um, the biggest impediment to regional integration um, or cooperation in uh, South Asia I is a state. State means uh, governments, uh, bureaucracy plus the armed forces. I drew a parallel between uh, European Union, how it emerged. And as you know that European history is much more war-torn, uh, bloodiest history than South Asia. Despite that, after the Second World War, they were able to forge uh, common um, economic community plus uh, various other liberalizations, including monetary union, as uh, our colleague from Maldives said. Uh, I do understand there are some ba backlash now. The way the policy is made in European Union is somewhat unique from any other regional groupings, whether in Asia, Africa, or there, the policies are made by European Council where technocrats and bureaucrats work. Politicians are not involved. Uh, in uh, policy making. Of course, they have to agree to, uh, once uh, technocrats prepare the policies and put forward to, to the governments uh, or European Parliament, then of course it has to be approved by politicians. But nevertheless, the policy making process itself is not attached to the politicians or the political divisions between uh, separate countries. So that to me is a positive aspect of that whereby they were able to forge ahead in um, uh, many um, areas of uh, integration, uh, including monetary integration. Of course, people would argue that recently there have been backlash, uh, Brexit, uh, two, three weeks ago, there was the elections in Netherlands. Fortunately, um, the, uh, the anti-Europeans could not win, but the reality is much more. I'm sure over time they will realize the, the negative aspects of um, uh, closed economies uh, kind of uh, issues. So, I, uh, so in South Asia, as you know, most of the states we have had huge bu bureaucracies, we have had uh, military authoritarian governments, uh, maybe only Sri Lanka and India uh, almost had uh, democratic uh, governments. Um, and uh, always uh, bureaucrats and uh, bureaucrats uh, love barriers because uh, that's what uh, <laughs> they are in demand and uh, they make uh, money out of that uh, unofficially and officially. So uh, you can't change that mindset. One way to undo that, to my understanding, is bring about like supranational, um, a, even SAR could become uh, a European Union, a Union kind of thing, but then the way the SAR operates and EU operates is different. Policies are made by technocrats, and that's the way I would like to um, for the South Asians to go ahead. If we depend on politicians, I'm sure we won't get too far. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Dizi. Thank you very much. Um, I'll also try to keep it short. Well, it almost seems like when you talk about uh, connectivity and integration in South Asia, it almost feels like we're talking about utopia. Yes. Uh, well, let's then talk about utopia. Let's say One Asia, the concept of One Asia. As uh, my colleague from Sri Lanka was talking about European Union, 
and how it works. They have an European Parliament and all of that. But we only have SAC, which meets, the head of states meet and talk about it, go back, and then the politicians will control whatever happens after that. But we're at this session, we are about to talk about way forward. Now, what I would suggest is that we start changing the rhetoric from threats of integration <coughs> to reducing threats because of integration. We are talking about changing the narrative. We're talking about uh, why integration is a plus rather than a threat. And slowly, that's an immediate or Im immediate change we can bring about. The medium term work that we can do is to use the mechanisms that are in place towards this end, towards the integration, towards increasing economic exchange to shared economies, bringing about common policies. That could be a medium term exercise. And then I would go on to express on the long term, and that is to inspire our youth, as uh, Sajiv was talking about the impact of the youth, and in the last session we talked about media and uh, social media and the education of the youth. If the youth can be inspired to think about the elusive utopia of one Asia or a connected South Asia, East Asia, and the Middle East, then maybe 20 years down the track, we can actually sit here and be confident that we can achieve those goals and there is a lot to happen before that. The mechanisms, the institutions that needs to come up, and all of that will and can happen if we try and follow a way forward that actually inspires to bring that in the next few years. We have talked about media, we've talked about economy, we've talked about uh, cultures, threats, all of that in the last uh, two days. What we have learned and what we know from the last two days is that from every country, from every institution, all of the studies, all of the conversations and discussions center around why the countries can't agree. The inconsistencies of our socio-cultural, ethnic, security, and economic policies these inconsistencies that we hang on to, that we try by an a, a air of protectionism, the policies that are brought about this protectionist attitude is what is holding us back. So we need to let go. We need to have confidence that the future will change only when we talk about integration in, uh, in a sense of increasing security and development to the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. I. Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I deeply appreciate to all of the participants and organizers uh, to very comprehensive the, the seminar and conference, we share each other. So a lot of our, our friends from the Middle East or also the South Asia. And the ASEAN is, I think, only one from Myanmar. Anyhow, my presentation, you may notice a lot of photo. This is a reality. Real happen, not now. Last three years or last four years, 2012, I went there. And then I explode everywhere to give the message up to the decision maker. Now, along the dead border, this one not happen. To more develop how to solve the problem. So we have to talk, we have to fighting, we have to argue each other. But anyhow, we are going to change the positive change. Not for us, for our new generation. Now today conference, yesterday conference, Teresa is said, not for us for our next generation. Because of the world is a changing already, globalization. Nobody cannot hit anything. Nobody cannot monopoly even any business. We need transfer, uh, we need transparency, we need to tra trust. 
That's why I would like to request to all of you, all country, each border, we need to discuss, open discussion. Number one, definition of border. We don't know what is a border. Each country, uh, a lot of country, a lot of policy, a lot of rule and regulation, a lot of the uh, law. But we have to definite, uh, the, how do you call clarify the definition of border. So the border meaning, some is here, uh, for example, between China and Myanmar, coming uh, for, for the, uh, uh, the our Myanmar border, la, and the Muse is a, uh, the border distance uh, at the, the nearest city, nearest district town. Another is the nearest city town. This, this along the border, they can easy do a trading or easy do to, to share the uh, commodity, whatever. More easy than the other normal trade. And you know, we need to definition of border. We have to check it. Second, which priority we have to? First priority we have to people to people, uh, tourism, education, healthy. How to easy the visa? This one we have to go another step. We have to write down the roadmap for future step by step. First two years, another two years, another three years. How to improve the step by step? We need to agree the roadmap also. So we can start small step, quick step. We cannot, how to go, we cannot compromise everything within one year, two years because of nature, culture, religion, the, the government, everything are different. But everything are say one thing. We are human together. We are friends together. That's why we need to clarify and we start small step, quick step. This is very important. And finally, I would like to share, we need to transparency and trust. No, sorry, my, my, my presentation is not a systematic, please forgive me. Everything uh, depends on not only private sector, or uh, not only public sector, depend on public, private, and then civil society. We must discuss three sectors, private, public sector, private sector, civil society sector. We call the, uh, the multi-stakeholder, we have to discuss multi-stakeholder discussion. So at the time, we need the strategy and then stamina. And then we need the scale, we need the smooth. With scale must smooth. Without smooth, the scale cannot use. Scale is must smooth. And then we have the simple and also the smart. Simple and smart, scale and smooth, strategy and stamina. We have to strategy this way, all people together. And then we move forward. To the according to the law. Finally, is a PPP. Just I want a PPP is a infrastructure development. This is a public sector consider ICD development, development for logistic, trade facility legislation, promote law enforcement. I can I say this is a very important before we start anything, and then we can move step by step. So, our, one of the ch uh, previously Chinese leader. Mosido, you know Mosido, everybody know Mr. Mo. Mr. Mo announced his soldier, they went to marching, law marching. You must move your left step, one step, and then you can march him left and right, left and right. You go to a thousand and thousand miles. So we we have to share the knowledge and press uh, share the knowledge and we find the policy and we find everything. We have to inform each government. And we must initiate ourselves. First, what we do, government like or not, doesn't matter. And then we compromise government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Smriti? Yeah, just uh, two, three points very quickly. Uh, yesterday, DJ was speaking of uh, connectivity as a public good. I think probably we also need to work on how to sell uh, connectivity as a public good. Uh, in that context, probably we can, uh, you know, sell it to the people where the roads passes that you know, this will bring in a kind of economic opportunity in terms of job creation because otherwise it is being seen as just, you know, facilitating business where the big businessmen are going to benefit, where the truckers are going to benefit. For the common public, uh, there is nothing uh, if the connectivity, physical connectivity network is there. So, so therefore, I think uh, selling connectivity.
connectivity as a public good is as significant as having uh, the connectivity infrastructure. And the second issue is that um, in any kind of connectivity network, I think the border states need to play border states or border region because not every, every all the countries have a border state and they have to play a kind of, uh, a lead, you know, take a kind of lead in, in having this connectivity project. And though in, in the context of India, we have enabled some of the border states to take lead, but I'm not very sure about the neighboring countries where, you know, the border region have given uh, the same kind of uh, emphasis in, in terms of taking the lead because as you, uh, you know, one has to say that. So it, it should be simultaneous. On the Indian side, when you empower the border states, the border region on the other side needs to be empowered in the similar manner. Otherwise, you know, things will not uh, move if we are uh, thinking of border in terms of economic connect rather than uh, a political uh, disjoint. I think the last uh, point which I would like to make is connectivity between the universities and col colleges and institutions. Because I think you spoke about the youth, you know, taking a lead. Because I think uh, if there is uh, much connectivity between the universities and colleges, probably, you know, that will create a kind of environment where you understand, not only understand each other, but, but also at the same time able to exchange uh, ideas, which actually at the, at, at the current juncture is completely lacking. So the connection between the universities, uh, the research institutes, I know IDSA has quite a bit of connectivity between the research institutes, but the same is not uh, true of the most of the research institutes. So I think uh, that probably will enable in terms of uh, taking joint uh, research project where which will enable to understand a common problem, you know, from two different perspective, and probably you can arrive at a kind of conclusion which, you know, one can uh, put forward. So therefore, I think the connectivity between the educational institution, I'm using the term in a very broad fashion, actually will help when we are speaking of connectivity, uh, either it is physical or economic, though of course we do not speak of the politics of connectivity in this entire conference. We mostly concentrated on the economics and the feasibility of the connectivity. I think that is where the politics of connectivity will have less salience if the younger generation understand why connectivity is necessary and how uh, you know uh, the youths need to understand each other. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Castro. of the last session has a lot of advantage, uh, I mean in terms of the serial. Uh, advantage is uh, most of the people's attention uh, span have gone to coma, so it's a challenge to wake them up. Let me ask something straight, no matter how thin the crowd is. How many in this room realistically think that in 2030, say another 13 years, the things we talked about last two days will significantly change? For example, we'll have a South Asian Economic Union, there'll be free trade, there'll be free movement of uh, people and goods, there'll be a lot of regional power trade, India will work as the hub of uh, power trade, uh, inter-region tourism, which is now 33%, will shoot up to 60% plus, then uh, there'll be digital uh, regional connectivity. How many in this room believe within the next 13 years, and speak from your heart, there'll be significant improvement in this area? Please raise your hand. Don't think too much, then you'll get clouded with analysts. Except IDSA, I know they'll raise their hand. <laughs> IDSA is not allowed to vote. I want the non-IDSA people. Okay, I would rather, okay. <laughs> Even counting them, look at the sheer number who are not raising their hand. That, only one hand. So, that is the reality we're encountering. As much as we'd like to be optimist, the history a last 30 plus years have not given us much reason to be optimist, but still we are because uh, history is also a bad motorist. It never tells you when it takes the next turn. So we just hope in South Asia that bad turn history takes. Now when 
I was given the task of uh, talking about opportunities, challenges, potentials and way forward and original seven and a half minutes cut down to five minutes. I was asking myself how can I do justice to this task. So I did something little uh, clever. I skipped the post lunch session, went into my room and whatever limited creativity I have I have tried to put into action. This will not cover everything but it will capture hopefully the essence of what we talked about and there has been a lot of intelligent discussions, deliberation, insights and it's impossible to cover them all. But what I'm going to share with the next four minutes hopefully broadly will capture the essence of what we talked about and still give us reasons to be optimistic. Had we not been optimists, we wouldn't have been here. So let me share it with you.
all we, we could have done in four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think on a very optimistic note, but unfortunately, Suji wants to have the last word. <laughs> so no, one, one minute for Suji. No, I just uh, listening to everybody. Just this thought came up, and to say that you know, which is covered in this presentation also, to say that we've talked about free trade zones, we've talked about special economic zone. Perhaps one of the thoughts after this, and you know, I was listening to everybody, is to talk about border economic zones, and that could be a, an area. And I, I'm definitely taking it on, and maybe we can just that could be an idea we can throw in to say we look at you know sort of how do we work about it so that could be the word we coined maybe somebody would have done it earlier but that was what came in i just tweeted just now and i think i'm very excited about it thank you thank you i think with this i open it to the house for we have some time about uh, say 10 minutes 15 minutes please give us very your very short and crisp comments as to what can we do further rana saab Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I mean, no, I'm very pleased that we would be speaking about strengthening cooperation, strengthening connectivity. Now we're talking, as uh, Dr. Didi has mentioned and as Professor Kuzru, integration. This is what we're after, after all. We're not, we've been shy to use that word, integration of South Asia as an economy. <coughs> but having said that, uh, I, 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 I also like to support with them. We are proposing projects of integration at the local level, say, between Nepal and Bihar, two districts of say, where even the common person, in the common people can, can, can trade and invest and share their skills and so on in terms of say, holding dramas, musicals, in terms of holding art bazaars, in terms of holding animal fairs, and in terms of artisanal and handicraft fairs. This is on the local e integration at the local level. Now, the po point I want to make is that, you know, is that the integration that we also need is the, in view of the environmental, the climate change and, uh, and global warming, the, the north-south linkages that are required, the, the, the lowland highland linkages that are required between the plains and the Himalayas. And for that, we have to conceive of the rivers and the river basins as the fundamental of connectivity or integration of the economy as a whole. Ambassador? Uh, thank you, Chair. I think just a uh, couple of points. I think first thing we have to realize that geopolitics will remain uh, in this, I mean, in the picture. And so so would the disruptive state policies will, will remain. But I think we can exploit the full potential of social media uh, by means of online seminars, this, uh, video conferences, so on and so forth, the specific themes and the outcome to be filtered to the media everywhere. Uh, <coughs> The, uh, the, what I liked about uh, Ambassador Prasad's point about common regional goods is a very good one because uh, if the success stories actually are built upon and developed and publicized, I think it will change the perception of people in a certain way and I think that will be the biggest gain that we can think of. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that through this kind of uh, interaction that I mentioned on various uh, kind of uh, interest groups and so on and so forth, which is easy, doesn't require visa and so on and so forth, I think it will certainly help in certain amount of balancing that is required to shape the government thinking. Thank you. Um, just brief comments. I think what we need to do is popularize the term South Asia. Louder, louder, please. Hi. Uh, so what we need to do, in my opinion, is to popularize the term South Asia and bring it into societal consciousness. Uh, what I mean by that is the first time I came across the term was when I was 14 or 15 years old, and that was also a cursory mention in relation to SARC. Uh, so that makes it a very administrative term almost. Uh, if South Asia as an analytical frame of reference can be included in our curriculums, all national curriculums, uh, at a much earlier stage uh, when a child's formative, during a child's formative years, uh, I think uh, that 2030 vision might be more practically implementable. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? mention about uh, SARC satellite. Uh, I would like to just mention over here is that that program is uh, on track. Uh, it was conceived by Prime Minister in 2014. We were supposed to launch a satellite obviously in December uh, for obvious reasons, uh, 2016. But now it may go uh, up into the space in the next 15 days or so. So the program is on track. Another suggestion which I have got is that yesterday the Minister had made a statement about cyber security issues. One can uh, devise a mechanism
Yes, please.
activity is undoing the border, but I would say undoing the barriers, if at all it is, if you want to put it, because uh, I remember the kind of a slogan which was being made that borders cannot be changed, but they can be made irrelevant. And it is here uh, that uh, with the permission of the DG, uh, I suggest that if IDSA can take up a project on connectivity, where uh, some of the panelists have mentioned the clusters of connectivity, go into the clusters of connectivity, civilizational, cultural, economic, infrastructure, sports and education, entertainment, whatever, one, one goes into and then leave those clusters which are already being worked upon, like the infrastructure and, and economic. A lot of work has been done. What has not been done, and I am just looking at it in terms of the uh, task force or research project approach, whatever you think uh, more, vi uh, more, more, more viable, more, fi uh, more, more feasible, uh, then take up those subjects which have not been done, and that is what I think the previous session brought it out very, very well, and identify and isolate what are the obstacles there. Particularly, it's not only the governmental obstacles. I think some points have been made very, very clearly. Even people generally, or uh, there is a big question whenever I talk about South Asia. So far as India centrality is concerned, all other countries are worried about one big question, how close is not too close. They don't want to get merged into either in terms of identity or culture or economy or any matter. So the the, the word integration is fascinating, but it is quite repelling to many that you, you don't really want to want to get into it. Therefore, get into these clusters and get into the obstacles which are coming up, which are historical, which are civilizational. I mean, what civilization? If you are propagating a sectarian component of civilization, which is ethnically dominated, which is religiously dominated, we won't go very far. There is a composite culture in all the countries which cuts across their ethnic boundaries, religious boundaries, regional boundaries. But somehow the state structures are such that a dominant component is being emphasized. And therefore once you start in terms of civilizational approach, you run into problems. I mean if anybody from India simply wants to emphasize Hinduism and Buddhism, would run into problems with many other neighbors. Therefore, we, what kind of a civilization? Anyway, get into these stakeholders which are coming in the way of connectivity, get into the obstacles, and then see how best they can be addressed. Mm -hmm. So if you have a three component of kind of a research project or even an article or a small monograph, uh, maybe there is a possibility of some policy inputs, leaving uh, those areas which are already being worked about in very extensive manner, like economic, trade, investments, industrialization, being worked about, even communication, being worked about, infrastructure, being worked about, but not in other areas, uh, which uh, I think previous uh, and, and most of the panelists are from, uh, have identified in, in different ways. Uh, whether it is workable or not, I leave it to the, to the institute. And all I can say is, let us give a big hand to the panelists again, and thanks to the organizers for having all of us.